Talk of the Bay here on K-Squid, and you know what we're going to talk about? The Bay. (laughs) So I guess this is the real Talk of the Bay tonight. (laughs) All right, and to talk about the Bay is someone who spent a lot of time on it, in it, and around it. Dan Heafley, former director of the O'Neill Sea Odyssey, and one of the architects of our protections off the Central Coast for not having it be the oil drilling capital of the world. So thank you for that. (laughs) It's a pleasure being here, Rachel. Thanks for having me tonight. It's great and to but, have you. And it's great to be able to come in during this expansion drive that you're doing. I mean, uh, we were just talking off air, and uh, if this drive's successful, you will triple your listenership, essentially your potential listenership, adding 400,000 listeners. And it's a great thing to offer people around Monterey Bay because you are truly a community radio station. I mean, there are other public stations and they're great uh, in this area, but this one is really community based and uh, it's, it's grassroots and you can get all kinds of diverse topics and music. Uh, it's really wonderful what you provide. So it's, Thank it's you. a wonderful thing that you're doing. We're so happy that you're here to celebrate that with us and we're so close. It'll be a really exciting moment when we hit that final mark, and I know we're going to do that soon. So, you know, maybe a good segue off of that idea of this Monterey Bay being a region. The bay is what unites us. I mean, we are clustered around it in all these different communities. And one thing that we all share in common is the beauty of looking out and seeing this vast ocean space. Right. We don't see what's underneath it. Right. But we know there's all these industries connected to it. There's people who make their living through it. That's either right whale watching or fishing. So walk us through some of the history, um, just interesting maybe timeline points of the development of this space uh, right? that we live and how it's changed over time. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Monterey Bay has always been an area attractive for visitors. So tourism has always been an element. Oil has also been an element as well. You mentioned uh, offshore oil. There was actually shoreside oil drilling happening in the late 1800s, early 1900s, along portions of the bay up to San Mateo County at the North Coast. Um, and uh, that's an indicator that there's something very valuable um, uh, along the coastline, underneath the water, underneath the seafloor, uh, as well as underneath the land that was interested, interesting to the oil companies and it's very attractive, and which is oil reserves, uh, especially between Santa Cruz and San Francisco. So um, offshore oil development really began in earnest in the 40s and 50s off California. Um, the Central Coast had not had offshore oil per se, um, but in the late 70s, the Carter administration floated bad pun, uh, the first proposals for offshore development. And a gentleman named Jim Rote, uh, who was a friend of uh, Sam Farr, who was then a Monterey County supervisor, uh, called Sam and said, hey, there's a proposal to drill for oil. And Sam said, oil? There isn't any oil here, and, and why would anybody be interested? Well, in fact, it was of interest. So the federal government made a proposal for lease sales. An organization called Save Our Shores was formed in 1978 uh, by eight individuals, all volunteers. And um, up until that time, of course, there had been really uh, fierce battles fought. There was a proposal for a nuclear power plant at Davenport Landing. There's a proposal for housing development where Wilder Ranch is now. Uh, there's a proposal for a deep oil port at Moss Landing. Uh, there was the conference center, right? Like right on Lighthouse Field. That's right, that uh, Gary Patton, Catherine Byers, and others were deeply involved in in the late 70s. So a lot of this built up to, so there was already a movement of people concerned about the environment. So the offshore oil movement really uh, tapped into that. Um, Again, another bad pun. Um, And there were several uh, proposals after that for federal leasing, especially when Ronald Reagan took office. He had two secretaries of interior, uh, Donald Hodel and most notably James Watt, who wanted to go full speed ahead. 
And it really united. You mentioned United uniting Monterey Bay, he united the business community, the agriculture community, the tourism community, environmentalists. It was something everybody could get behind. And that was in this region. It wasn't necessarily true around the rest of the country. Today, about 80% of people are opposed to offshore oil. Um, back then, it was a smaller amount. But in this region, for sure, uh, because of the effects that uh, such an activity would have on this region. And, and wasn't there a big oil spill in Santa Barbara that kind of got everybody aware of how devastating it would be to, like, endangered sea otters if it happened here? Absolutely. In fact, the 1969 oil spill, it was the Union Oil Platform A off Santa Barbara. It had a rupture at the seafloor, so it just gushed oil uh, for a very long time. And that led to a spate of bills that were passed in 1972 because of anger from the oil spill. This is the first time an environmental disaster was visible to people across the country on something called television before the Internet. But people saw this. They saw the oiled birds. They saw the oiled sea lions. They saw the disaster unfolding in front of them. They said, how can this happen? So uh, Richard Nixon was president, and he put a moratorium on oil development. And he tried to do a few fixes, but it wasn't enough. So Congress, um, compelled by people's reaction to this, passed a slate of, of bills in 1972, uh, the Clean Air Act. They uh, developed the EPA or authorized development of the EPA, the Clean Water Act, and then an act that created national marine sanctuaries, which we'll get to uh, in a minute. Also that year, California voters passed Proposition 20, the California Coastal Act which led to establishment of the Coastal Commission and public access. So um, these are the tools that people had. And one of the things that President Nixon did was set up a public process for offshore oil. It wasn't enough. People could testify uh, how they felt about proposals for offshore oil development, but the decisions were in Congress. And we were lucky to have later Leon Panetta as our member of Congress, and then later Sam Farr and, and now Jimmy Panetta. But you know, you're dealing with a large number of people here, not all of whom are from California. So uh, fast forward to the mid 80s, the city of Santa Cruz being very frustrated with what was happening with federal offshore development of uh, Marty Wormhout, John Laird, Gary Patton, Kim Schantz of Save Our Shores, who was the chair, uh, decided to try a local approach, which is to deny uh, or to um, require that any onshore facilities so pipelines, helicopter pads, dewatering facilities, approval for those be subject to a vote of the people. You don't ban them. You subject it to a vote of the people because you have federal constitution. You can't interfere with interstate commerce, but you can subject something to local planning laws. So they did that in the city of Santa Cruz, got 82% of the vote. The that vote also authorized allocating some money. Save Our Shores was hired to spread the idea. They hired me. Uh, so I spent the next couple of years going up and down the state in my Ford Pinto, getting these laws passed. We got 26 of them done before momentum started to slow down. Why did it slow down? Because the oil industry sued um, the Western Oil and Gas Association. And that scared people, you know, because they have a lot of power. And uh, another indicator of their power is there was a debate in Pescadero, a little community to the north of us, 300 people showed up, uh, and I was supposed to debate somebody who showed up but the vice president of Chevron. Holy and he said, <laughs> you know, and that, that's an indicator of the interest they had. And he said, well, we're not really interested in, you know, the Central Coast. Well, then why are you here? Um, Usually they don't send the president of the company to <laughs> go debate in a 300-person yeah. town. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so... The, so this was well and good. We had a lot of the California coast covered this way, but uh, we segued to work on Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which Leon Panetta, through an act of Congress, got authorized. Uh, so a coalition of environmental groups um, decided to push for the largest boundaries because the, pro the core proposal for Monterey Bay Sanctuary was just Monterey Bay. It would not go north of Santa Cruz. And we needed to protect the area from Santa Cruz to San Francisco because, as I mentioned before, that's where the oil is. That's where it's economic for oil industry to do their business. So, and luckily, San Mateo County's local ordinance that they had, had done also required, was very strict in this regard. But we wanted to ensure that there was protection. So, um, 
4,000 people spoke at the public hearings and wrote letters. This is before the internet again. People used stamps on envelopes to write their letters and showed up at hearings. And um, because uh, the um, proposal became ripe during a presidential election year in 1992, George H.W. Bush was running for re-election. He had a background in the oil business, but he needed California to win. He was running against uh, a former Arkansas governor named Bill Clinton, and uh, he tried very hard. One of the things he did is he approved the largest boundary for Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Um, So we got the big boundary of the sanctuary. He didn't get to be, he didn't get reelected, but we got something very wonderful. And this sanctuary is one of, of, of five sanctuaries on the West Coast. There are four of them that are next to each other uh, off California. We're hoping for a fifth, uh, Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary to the south of us, which would close the gap uh, from Santa Barbara up to Point Arena in Mendocino County. If you just joined us, I'm speaking with Dan Hafley, ocean conservationist and architect of some of our best protections against oil drilling off the coast of California. This is KSQD Santa Cruz, 90.7 FM, and we're listening to Talk of the Bay. I'm your host, Rachel Ann Goodman, and I've been living here on and off since 1980. Took a little seven-year break to live in Appalachia, but you know, when I came back, it felt more populated and more industrial and more built up Mm -hmm. just because you preserve what's in the ocean and what's happening under the ocean and prevent drilling doesn't mean there aren't increasing pressures from human activity on our ocean so save our shores does a lot of that too don't they they try to pass plastic bans and other ordinances that would prevent runoff into the bay what are some of the biggest things still to be done and I want to get back to the sanctuaries that are going to be expanding, too, in a moment. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I also want to think about the other pieces of the connection to the Bay, because we're all living on the edge of it right now. Right, right. So, yeah, Save Our Shores is a good example because, you know, they're known for the coastal cleanup, which prevents debris from getting into. And that's huge because there's, what, uh, six trillion pieces of plastic in the ocean and counting now. And a lot of that is, you know, could, that number would be a lot larger if we didn't have the international coastal cleanup. But also Save Our Shores, not only did they do the ordinances that I mentioned, but um, they uh, passed 52 laws uh, to ban single-use plastics and styrofoam. Um, they've been very active in uh, working with local governments to prevent non-point source pollution. This is everything that doesn't go through the sanitary sewer that goes down the storm drains, down the creeks and rivers into the ocean. We've seen a lot of that after the storms, a lot of that debris. Yes, it, and still brown out there. I mean, I was just there what last week and walking along the ocean, and it had been several weeks since the storms. The ocean was still kind of a brown color. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And some there's algal uh, pollution. There's nutrient-rich pollution. Um, some of that comes from fertilizers. Some of that just comes from topsoil. So Save Our Shores has been working on this, and they've also been, interestingly, working on some other issues in the ocean. They worked with the aquarium on getting a ban on seafloor mining uh, in state waters off California, and that's a thing, lithium batteries. A lot of lithium comes from uh, uh, undersea mining. So um, they have been doing a lot of this, and um, I'm currently on the board of Monterey Bay Sanctuary Foundation, which raises money for the sanctuary projects. One of those projects is the um, uh, what's called the Iconic Kelp Project to restore kelp beds and to maintain those kelp beds to fight climate change, both to adapt us to the impacts of climate change and then to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere because the ocean's absorbing CO2 at an alarming rate and it's becoming more acidic, acidic as a result or less basic as a result if you look at the pH scale. But um, there are a lot of these... There's a lot of ways people can get involved and Save Our Shores, Monterey Bay Sanctuary Foundation. Those are two really good examples, Watsonville Wetlands Watch. All these activities you mentioned on land, Mark Silverstein, director of the Elkhorn Slough, once told me, so I had a professor that told me that when you look at the ocean, you want to know what's affecting it, look up on the land. It's all that runoff. It's, it's everything. It's all connected. It all runs downhill, as we saw very quickly from the atmospheric river. It all washed everything, and all the debris from uh, all the mountains and the trees crashing ended up down, downstream and in the water. 
I, I was curious about one thing about kelp, because you mentioned kelp being part of, it's like the yeah. redwood forest of the ocean. Yeah. Um, but does the sanctuary law still allow kelp harvesting? Because I, I understood kelp is under attack by sea urchins because of the sea star wasting disease. Not mm-hmm. Their predators are gone, essentially. Yeah. Um, so how does that mesh with keeping the ecosystem healthy if people are harvesting it? Is that sustainable? Yeah, and, and possibly not. Um, but... You know, the uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife had had been issuing permits for kelp harvesting. I believe they still do. That's one of the things that the sanctuary is going to look at through this Iconic Kelp Project is they're gathering or they have gathered um, the scientists and what's called the Research Activities Panel to look at exactly um, what this, what's happening to the kelp forests and the areas where we'd be most effective making a difference in trying to restore and restore health to the kelp forests. Uh, one of them you mentioned is urchins. There's a project called the Giant Kelp Project going off off Monterey Peninsula to remove urchins from the system where they have overwhelmed the kelp forest, as you know. Sea otters live in the kelp forest. They eat the urchins, which eat the kelp. Of course, the kelp provide habitat for crabs and fish and all kinds of other creatures. So it's very important to be able to manage that um, system. And so the answer is yes, there's been some harvesting. Um, Kelp is well known for growing fast. I heard it grows like two or three feet a day, which yeah. is astounding. And it's an algae, not even a, a tree or a plant. That's true. And very, <laughs> very good at absorbing carbon. So it's a matter of strategically looking at where the kelp forests are best done. Um, there's a very good, there's been a very robust monitoring project, kelp, uh, kelpwatch.org. Um, they've been looking at this for many, many years and looking where the kelp forests have been strong and where they have been less than strong. And so this will be the baseline upon which the scientists will go. And that's the thing about marine sanctuaries is, you know, the conclusions are driven by science. Um, The mission of sanctuaries is education, resource protection, obviously, but also research. And you use the research to inform those management decisions as to how you restore kelp. Yeah, and 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 everything else too, right? I mean, we are one of the premier marine science areas in the nation, aside from Woods Hole. Yeah. Maybe we're bigger. We have Ambari, we've got Hopkins, we've got, you know, the aquarium down there and a lot of people, and UC Santa Cruz Marine Biology uh, research going on at Long Marine Lab. So we got both sides of the bay. Moss Landing Marine Laboratory. Moss Landing in the middle. Yeah. So it really ties us, all these scientists together, which is exciting. I mean, it's an exciting place to be because all this cutting edge work is being done. We'll go back to our conversation with Dan Heafley now. We were talking about kelp restoration and the various sanctuaries. Um, tell us about this new sanctuary that's under consideration, and is it likely to go through under um, Biden's administration? Yes, it's very hopeful. So, I mean, nothing is certain until it's done. And at the end, there is a period, a 90-day comment period, during which a member of Congress can intervene because uh, there there is an element to these that does require approval by the three branches of government. But the um, this also has a very interesting history. So there was originally a proposal for a Morro Bay sanctuary many, many years ago. And, of course, there's a Morro Bay Ashore and Reserve uh, Research Reserve that you have now if you're ever down in that area. Um, when Monterey Bay Sanctuary was being considered, there was a hearing that occurred in Monterey. And there was a staffer there from the county of San Luis Obispo who got up to speak. And he made a dramatic proposal to move the boundary of Monterey Bay Sanctuary South to cover all of San Luis Obispo County. And at the time, it was an interesting proposal. We were focused on the northern area, Santa Cruz to San Francisco. Unfortunately, the member of Congress representing that area at the time was not friendly to that idea. He was supportive of offshore oil. And the idea didn't go anywhere. But over the years, people kept the faith. And then in... um, uh, 2015, Fred Collins, who who since passed away very sadly, but he was the chief and the chair of the Northern Chumash Tribal Council. And he, with the help of the Sierra Club and Surfrider Foundation and EcoSlow, nominated uh, the Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary to cover San Luis Obispo County and uh, northern uh, Santa Barbara County down to Point Conception, 7,000 square miles. Our sanctuary, Monterey Bay, is 6,094 square miles, so it would go much further offshore. 
uh, like our sanctuary, it would include a, a seamount. Uh, we have Davidson Seamount. They would have Rodriguez Seamount. Includes an underwater canyon. We have Monterey Bay Submarine Canyon. They would have Arguello Canyon. Um, and there's persistent upwelling down there. So it's a very rich area. And for Chumash, it's very important because not only are there sacred sites that are there and part of the sanctuaries do is they preserve cultural sites, but um, Chumash, who've been an ocean-going people, have been stewarding the land and having a worldview that included the natural environment around them for thousands of years. So they know how to do this. So um, that nomination was taken by Noah. Uh, now, Violet Sage Walker, who's um, uh, Fred Collins' daughter, is chair of the Northern Chumash Tribal Council, and they've been carrying this forward. And um, they had public comments um, last year. 30,000 people responded online, which was huge. And um, there's going to be a draft plan. And we're hoping that the draft plan looks a lot like the original nomination that Fred Collins submitted, 7,000 square miles, and would also protect the area from offshore oil development and other things. And uh, the, the California sea otter would be able to expand its range to there? Yes, yes. they were keeping them away, weren't they? They didn't want them around there. <laughs> that meant yeah. they had to protect them. Yeah, there was a little sign out there. Yeah, no otters allowed. Yes. Isn't that discrimination? Yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, the draft plan is due out in a couple months maybe even sooner than that. Uh, it's in review right now in Washington, and uh, we're hoping that this gets done in 2024 next year. And who has the power to make it happen? Is it just the president, or is it um, members of Congress? God members forbid. of Congress get a review period, so they get to, if they want to intervene, they can. And that has not happened up until this point. There was an expansion of the Greater Farallon Sanctuary. It was an expansion of Cordell Bank Sanctuary. There have been some other things that have happened with marine sanctuaries in recent years, and Congress has not intervened, so we're hoping that that will be the case this time. I think it'll be primarily a president presidential um, action. And it's not the only sanctuary that's that's in the pipeline right now. There's two tribally nominated sites up in Alaska. There's Marianas Trench. Uh, yes, there's those are federal U.S. federal waters out by the Western Islands out there in the Pacific, uh, which is now a Marine National Monument. There's a site in Pennsylvania, off Pennsylvania. There's a site off of, um, of uh, New York and New Jersey called Hudson Canyon. Do any of these prevent offshore wind? Uh, so that's the other question here. Um, actually, offshore wind is energy development, so they are prohibited in sanctuaries. And um, so there will be offshore wind to the west of southern Monterey Bay and northern Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. And this sets up a very interesting situation because, you know, wind, of course, is, is, is an important part. If we continue to live the lifestyles that we live, we're going to need a cleaner source of energy. But the, um, there, there were two lease sales that were held in, um, I believe it was November or December, one for the Humboldt area and one for what they call the Morro Bay area, which is southern Big Sur and northern uh, um, San Luis Obispo County. That area is about 375 square miles. And these and the lease sales were bid on, so there are companies that intend to develop. Uh, these would be um, floating platforms, um, wind platforms. So you'd need some sort of cabling to secure these to the seafloor. And of course, you have to get those electrons to land and into the grid. So you need some kind of cabling system for that. So Violet Sage Walker, um, chair of the Chumash uh, tri Northern Chumash Tribal Council wrote an op-ed in the San Luis Obispo Tribune. She said, you know, it's important that we know that offshore wind will be here. So we need to require these companies to uh, mitigate, to study and mitigate the effect on wildlife because we already have problems with whale entanglement and there's some other things. I mean, maybe there'll be, won't be any problems. Maybe there'll be a lot of problems, but we need to be able to use the opportunity to study this, understand it, and to uh, implement mitigations uh, for this, if this is something that's going to happen. And uh, the Chumash Marine Sanctuary, Monterey Bay Sanctuary, could be laboratories for those mitigations. I'm not sure, but um, uh, there will be um, offshore wind adjacent to these two sanctuaries, just as there's offshore oil development that's adjacent to the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary down south. 
it seems like of, between wind and oil drilling, there's there's a more obvious culprit of potential bad things happening, although I, do, I don't know everything about what wind is involved. Um, will we see them <laughs> off there, offshore there? About 25 miles off of Big Sur, so probably, I'm not sure uh, how tall On a tall clear these day, you can see the wind turbines. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so 25 miles, I'm not sure what the horizon lines are, I'm sorry, off of Southern Big Sur. That's okay. Um, but probably. It's the most beautiful part, you know, being there is looking out to sea. And, you know, <laughs> there was a lot of fight about that on Martha's Vineyard, I remember hearing. Yes. And, I think they ended up building it. I don't know. But uh, it's been delayed. And, and it just makes you realize that for every thing that has long-term implications, there's this feeling that we have to study it, which totally makes sense. But on the other side, there's this urgency to get off of oil. <laughs> so yeah. if only it could guarantee we'd get off oil to bring these things on right. board, that would be more impetus to... Yeah. And and the laboratory for this really, I mean, Violet Sage Walker went with the California Energy Commission to the North Sea in Europe, and there is offshore wind there. And that's where um, they said, you know, there are impacts on wildlife. So that's something that needs to be looked at. Um, Onshore wind has impacts, too. Like there's raptors getting killed in that's right. the wind turbines, and they're trying to figure out ways of having them not get chopped up by those big turbines. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, ideally, everybody has, you know, localized energy at their, their source, at their home. Um, a small turbine on your house. Yeah, or solar panels or what mm -hmm. have you. Yeah. Um, but we're, our economy is set up this way. So we do the best we can. And that's what marine sanctuaries do, is Monterey Bay Sanctuary was really the first national marine sanctuary to be done in an industrial area. We do a moss landing power plant. We have agriculture. We have other activities that occur <coughs> along the coastline, including those up by San Mateo and San Francisco, which Monterey Bay Sanctuary covers, sewage treatment plants, et cetera. So that's what marine sanctuaries do, is they interact with these entities and um, make the best they can, do the best they can to protect the resource. What's one thing as a citizen living along the Monterey Bay, as an individual, we talked about collective action and mm -hmm. government action and mm -hmm. regulation. What would one behavioral change, the biggest, most important one be, I know there's probably 10 you could list, um, that we as residents could do differently or stop doing or start doing, to quote my friend Jill Co Cody. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd say reduce your carbon footprint and eat low on the food chain. Um, those are things that people can do individually because climate change, you know, the, as I mentioned, the ocean absorbs excess CO2 and, and other greenhouse gases, and it's affecting the ocean. And of course, everything's connected to everything else. You know, ocean creates weather, you know, it affects land, what happens on land affects the ocean, atmosphere, all of it is interrelated. So just be more aware of what you're doing. Don't put oil on the ground when you're changing your oil and things like so it doesn't flow into the bay. Yeah, when Don't you see run your cat litter outside. <laughs> what else? Yeah, and if you see you see styrofoam on the ground after they pick up the trash cans, make sure those are put back in to the trash cans because that stuff gets out there and it gets ingested. Kills <clears throat> wildlife, yeah. Kills wildlife. So yeah. all of it is important. I mean, we humans have the biggest impact. So So we it, could have the biggest impact if we stopped doing a lot of the things we're doing. Right. Yeah. Right. We could change the trajectory for, for sure. And we need to. Well, I appreciate uh, you coming in and sharing all this with us. If people want to get in touch with you or the sanctuary, what's a good contact point for them to get involved or, you know, show up in some way physically or uh, yeah. virtually? <laughs> yeah. Well, we mentioned Save Our Shores, so saveourshores.org, Monterey Bay Sanctuary Foundation, MontereyBayFoundation.org. Um, Watsonville Wetlands Watch. There's all kinds of organizations. I would contact one of them. And if you want to get in touch with me about this evening, uh, I'm at dan.hafley at gmail.com. That's easy to remember. And we really thank you. You've been here since the beginning. You were one of our early guests, and I hope you'll come back again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And good luck with this campaign. Thanks for your support, Dan. Thanks for being here. <laughs>